All right, so uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and what you do here. My name is Tom Donnelly. This is the American Enterprise Institute, where I'm a resident fellow uh, in Defense and National Security Studies. Okay, and so if you take a step back and look at from the time period of August of 2002 leading up to March 19, 2003, how would you evaluate both the performance of the print and television news? Look, I think they did about what you would expect them to do. Um, uh, and the media's involvement or the, the uh, press's involvement in Iraq issues goes back well before that, so you're not beginning with a blank slate at that, at that um, initial point. Um, but look, I mean, the media relies primarily on uh, government sources when it comes to matters of war um, uh, and doesn't tend to cover war from the ground up except when the war is actually going on. Uh, I would say one of the things that is most questionable, however, was the uh, coverage from inside Iraq, uh, both during that period and for many years prior to that period, uh, just because of the way the Iraqi government restricted access and sort of negotiated with, uh, particularly with the television networks. Um, a lot of the coverage that, that came out of Iraq was probably misleading and yet yeah, incomplete. And, and so when you look at, what's that? What? Oh, right. I'm, when I'm asking a, a question, I may ask you to rephrase it since I'm not going to be including my yeah, okay. question. So okay. if I have to stop you to rephrase things. No problem. Um, and, and so what, it, what is your uh, view of the uh, United States foreign policy towards Iraq during this time period as well? Well, I was a supporter of the war. I remain uh, a strong supporter of the war. Um, I think we're winning. Uh, we've made it somewhat harder than it has to be. Uh, but I think this is a, a hugely important moment, not only for the United States and Iraq, but uh, throughout the region. And I'm, I'm particularly supportive of it because it'll bring freedom to a part of the planet that doesn't have a lot of it to begin with. And so when you look at um the mechanism under which uh, the legal case, do you see this as a act of preemptive self-defense? Uh, no, I don't. I think the, the I, I do not think that the Iraq war is a very good uh, test either legally, morally, or politically of the case for preemption. Um, the, the strongest case, certainly uh, legally, was that it was a continuation of the war that was already ongoing that began in 1991, extended through the 1990s, marked by things like um, the Iraqi attempt to assassinate former President Bush, the administration and the uh, uh, conflicts that took place uh, uh, in conducting the no-fly zones and so on and so forth. So I would tend to see this, again, not just matter as a matter of narrow the narrow legal case uh, for war, but certainly more broadly uh, and more profoundly as a war that has been continuing for uh, for some, you know, for more than a decade. And so when you look at uh, the international legal case, do you believe that uh, it was a violation of a ceasefire agreement and therefore? Well, I think there are a number of uh, legal arguments that, that could be advanced. First of all, there's the narrow question of, the, of Saddam's uh, compliance with previous UN resolutions. Secondly, there's an inherent way in which the way he violated those, particularly attacking American pilots or attacking American citizens, uh, would be regarded as an act of war under any definition. Um, but uh, uh, so you, you, there's a variety of choices to, to pick from, uh, from when, uh, when presenting the international legal case uh, for war. Uh, but I would say that the the broader moral case uh, was that he was, first of all, a hugely repressive tyrant uh, who had fomented violence not only against his own Iraqi fellow citizens, uh, but had essentially tried to uh, attack uh, virtually every other government on uh, any one of his borders, um, which is not, strictly speaking, uh, and in the traditional uh, uh, sense, um, a case of preemption, uh, but again, more an extenuation or a continuation of uh, a state of war that existed previously.
So did you see uh, Iraq as a threat to the uh, United States? Not as an immediate threat in the sense that they were about to uh, invade the United States or launch a strike in the United States. It's not something that they had uh, the capacity to do. Uh, however, they were continuing to target American pilots, to shoot at them, um, uh, again, for a period of, of more than a decade. A, a clear act of war. There had also been, as we discussed earlier, the violation of or the failure to comply with uh, uh, the UN resolutions enforced uh, and passed after the first Gulf War and the ones that uh, continued uh, uh, through the course of that decade. Um, those included uh, uh, incursions into both the, the Kurdish uh, zone in Iraq and into southern Iraq. Uh, uh, and included the continuing repression of the uh, uh, Shia majority uh, in Iraq, uh, throughout Iraq, and also continued uh, in ways not outside of Iraq uh, that very strongly suggested that uh, uh, Iraq's interest in uh, pursuing ties with terrorist organizations uh, continued unabated um, these were interests that kind of came and went, uh, uh, but certainly increased periodically uh, through the 1990s. And uh, there seems to be uh, an issue of after the military intervention ensued, there seemed to be a shift towards the humanitarian uh, intervention focus as being a, a big portion of that. However, do you see that they should have included that as part of their legal case? Well, uh, again, I would say that they certainly, or if, you, if they means the Bush administration and the president in particular, from the start, he made a comprehensive case uh, for going to war uh, that included, I, I would not say the humanitarian, uh, it wasn't a question of humanitarianism per se, but it was a question certainly of uh, applying American political principles to international uh, affairs, which strikes me as quite appropriate. It, w it would be acting in concert with our most fundamental political beliefs. Um, so there were, there were three elements, really, in the administration's rationale from the start. Um, the liberation argument, if you will, the larger national security argument, and that this was a war that had been continuing, and uh, this is a government that had you know, uh, conducted itself as an enemy for, for an extended period of time. And then there was the question of weapons of mass destruction, uh, uh, which was, um, again, uh, despite what we've learned since then, uh, certainly uh, a large part of the case for going to war, and, a, and actually, I would say, a pretty reasonable one, too. Um, and, you know, you, we can sift through the historical evidence to decide which was the most important one. But when we do so, I think we ought to also um, uh, uh, evaluate uh, the decision in that context to go to the United Nations. In other words, when you made your case before the United Nations, you chose to not assert your legal rights based on past uh, UN resolutions, but to seek a new resolution were the liberation arguments and the national security arguments arguments that were inherently going to appeal to a United Nations audience. So I would say that the, the decision to go to the UN in the context of late 2002 um, sort of skewed um, uh, the arguments. <laughs> Shit. It'll go, it'll run a couple times ago and answer. And I'll repeat the... I hope that's the last one. Okay. Okay, so start from yeah. uh, going to the UN. Right. The process of going to the United Nations sort of distorted uh, the comprehensive case that the Bush administration wanted to make uh, and put undue weight on the WMD arguments, in part because that was really the only issue that the UN was either competent to deal with or was politically interested in dealing with. And when I look at you know, this time frame, it seems like uh, after the authorization was passed in October, there seemed to be uh, 
viewing the United Nations as merely a political and as opposed to legal issue uh, by the mainstream media. It was a matter of, uh, we know we're going to war, it's a matter of when, not if, and it's more of a matter of using the UN as a military. Well, look, war coverage is a subset of political coverage, so it's kind of natural that the press should uh, emphasize the politics of the situation uh, more than the legality. And I also think there was a broader sense that the, uh, the question of legality uh, was already sort of fundamentally answered even going into uh, the late 2002 uh, UN debate because of the previous resolutions. Um, I, I think the administration was reasonably effective in presenting its case that just strictly as a matter of international law that it was on uh, pretty good ground even before that process uh, began. And again, I just think it's the natural when, when war does seem imminent as an event, uh, I think it's sort of more natural to focus on the political maneuverings uh, uh, prior to the war and the spotlight natu naturally shifts from uh, questions of legality to just questions of politics and uh, how the campaign might be conducted, military issues. It, when you say it's pretty well set, there seemed to be a huge debate from France, almost every other country, including within the international legal scholarly community. Well, th th there were divergent opinions in the scholarly community. Uh, that's, uh, I think, a matter of record. And I, th I think also that the way the, and, and um, you know, history, I think, sort of bears this out, that uh, there was no argument that was going to be politically convincing to the French. They would grasp at any straw to try to prevent the war from happening. So they advanced a contrary legal point of view. They, they argued uh, contrary political and security uh, points of view as well. Um, you know, I, I don't... I don't think the French were, uh, it was possible to convince the French on any of these grounds, be it legal, moral, political, military. So you, in other words, uh, pinning the blame almost squarely on France? No, no, I'm just trying to analyze why the French behaved the way they did. I think they made a strategic and political decision that uh, they opposed the invasion of Iraq, and they were willing to turn to any um, policy tools necessary or any argumentative tools uh, to try to sway opinion to their side. It seems perfectly, you know, nothing wrong in their their methods. I just think they made a, a, a wrong decision. But they were, you know, they were trying to uh, persuade nations in the United Nations, uh, trying to win votes uh, in the United Nations. So they quite naturally. Uh, used a whole host of arguments to try to buttress their their point of view. And when you look at countries like Turkey, who uh, turned down billions of dollars, Mexico, who's our ally, Chile, who has uh, potential trade agreements, how do you explain why they sided with the French and not the United States? Well, they, they're, first of all, they're sovereign governments and quite able to make up their own minds. And they had, uh, a I mean, in each case, the the calculus was very different, uh, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, they just disagreed with the decision to go to war, again, for a variety of reasons. Um, I, again, I, I would be hard pressed to say in each case what the decisive argument was. I think in almost none of the cases was the legal argument uh, uh, especially decisive. I think this was a political calculation uh, based on each country's uh, own assessment of its own interests uh, in the particular situation. It, it seems to me when I look at the legal case, though, and I look at both sides and try to adjudicate the facts, that the legal case by the United States doesn't really hold up. It, Why would you say that? Because uh, a United Nations Security Council resolution is different than a bilateral treaty signed by two sovereign governments. It's the Chapter 7 resolution that was imposed on Iraq. Therefore, the United Nations Security Council is the sovereign authority. Uh, that, that is a questionable interpretation of international law. And at the same time, there are the previously existing uh, uh, UN resolutions uh, of which Iraq was found to be in material breach. 
and certainly re uh, Resolution 1441, uh, uh, which carried explicitly uh, with it the threat of, you know, they didn't use the word explicitly, but was intended and interpreted, I think, uh, by all, or certainly explicitly advanced by Colin Powell uh, to include, uh, I forget the exact language, but it was clearly uh, the consequences of failure to, compl a failure to comply with that re resolution uh, were going to result uh, in military action, although it is true the French tried to uh, walk away from that interpretation, much to Secretary Powell's uh, great anger. So there shouldn't have been any um, uh, misunderstanding about, uh, at the very least, even if you wiped the previous resolutions off the books, about uh, what the United States intended in advancing and submitting Resolution uh, 1441. So you know, I, I don't think there was any uh, possible misinterpretation of what American intent was uh, and the American interpretation of what the uh, consequences would be from Resolution 1441, which was uh, unanimous, unanimously accepted by uh, the Security Council. Uh, so, a again, it seems to me that that's a pretty strong basis in international law and in, uh, you know, within the confines of the United Nations. Uh, 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 justifying subsequent uh, military action. But the John Nungaponte said that there's no hidden triggers or no automaticity in this resolution, and it was a general consensus that this was going to be, quote, a two-stage process. But that's exactly what there wasn't. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, what? No, no, I mean, there was no consensus that there was going to be an explicit second vote uh, authorizing war. There was going to be, you know, there was a debate at the time about this, about what, whether this was going to be, um, uh, uh, or what the, the triggering mechanism was going to be. And it was always the, uh, you know, very clear position of the United States government that no second, or, and which was hardly a second, but like a 15th resolution uh, was going to be necessary if Iraq was seen to be in noncompliance uh, uh, with the UN resolution. And when you take a step back and you look at international law as a body, do you see international law as um, helping or hurting the security of the United States? Well, for the most part, uh, it's definitely an I'm aid sorry, to... What is? Uh, I'm sorry. Um, look, uh, international law has almost always been a an aid to the United States. Uh, almost is a big loophole, and in many cases the interpretation of international law going back to uh, say the quasi war with France uh, has been uh, a hurdle for uh, American security. Um, the problem is not with those nations who comply with international law. The difficulty is to try to get, you know, those states and those non-states uh, who don't accept or comply with international law to to abide by these rules. Uh, Iraq being a very good. Uh, case in point, uh, Iraq's unwillingness to comply with, uh, you know, more than a dozen UN resolutions was part of the reason that we ended up continuing the war against Iraq. Uh, if Iraq had been, you know, a responsible citizen from an international legal perspective, uh, we probably wouldn't be where we are today. And when you look at the normative standard of international law, Usually there's a resolution that says you can use all necessary means, and when you're enforcing resolutions, usually there's a, a weighting of the proportionality of the military action versus what the actual resolution is saying. And when you look at the implicit versus explicit resolutions and, and the explicit uh, boundaries that was put on by 686, which was the resolution before 687, and you combine that with the explicit a penalty of sanctions for not uh, going to for uh, for not complying with disarmament obligations. It seems to me, from the international lawyers that I've talked to, that when you look at all these things and taking into consideration that this is operating outside of the normative standards of the United Nations. Well, I, I can't speak for the lawyers uh, to whom you spoke. Um, I, I'm aware of that uh, interpretation of the situation. But look, you got to look at this as a cumulative uh, set of offenses as well. 
it's it's not as though the legality or certainly the morality for going to war against Iraq necessarily rests on any one of of the resolutions. Again, there have been I, I think 1441. Correct me if I'm wrong. Was the 14th resolution attempting to uh, uh, prescribe Iraq's international behavior and uh, the probability of compliance on any one of these things was uh, pretty hard to uh, argue for, uh, certainly in by 2002. We had a track record of, uh, you know, international scoff lawism, if you will, on the part of Iraq. Um, and its ignorance or its refusal to comply with these uh, uh, resolutions um, and not simply its behavior as detailed in UN resolutions, but its past, uh, its past behavior uh, with regard and its, you know, willingness to to go to war with Iran, with Kuwait, to to play hanky panky with uh, terrorist organizations of one kind or another and in different forms over the course of time, painted a picture of a recidivist uh, criminal to extend the legal metaphor. Uh, so, um, international law that lacks any enforcement mechanism makes a mockery of the law. I mean, you know, it makes, and it certainly makes a moral travesty of the law. A, a, a set of international laws that serve to keep dictators like Saddam Hussein in power uh, are, makes you ask questions about the legal system. The purpose of law is not self-reinforcing, but to uh, to help. Uh, conduct international political life in a decent and, and in a moral way. So these may be shortcomings of international law if they serve to protect governments like, like Saddam's. It, it seems that the United Nations Security Council as a body has the right to enforce the resolutions. How can you argue that the United States unilaterally has the right to explicit, without ever explicitly saying that they can The UN in Security Council and the General Assembly has never enforced a resolution on its own. It has turned to sovereign nations to provide the means of enforcement. Again, having a lawmaking body, a so-called lawmaking body that has no means of enforcement or, or to, you know, divorce uh, uh, lawmaking from any practical application of justice in international life. Even if the United Nations had voted to go explicitly to go to war against Iraq, it would have been up to the United States and the coalition to make it so. So, you know, it's like having um, a domestic legal system without any police force to enforce the law or a set of uh, uh, security institutions to, to execute the will. Uh, of the international community. The United Nations has never had the means to enforce its own writ. Well, I guess a, an analog analogy would be if it's a federal law and you have a state trooper trying to enforce a federal law, this is the United Nations Security Council who has passed these resolutions. That jurisdiction, according to Article 2, Paragraph 4, is underneath the United Nations. It was never explicitly given to the United States to enforce these resolutions. Never Permission was never explicitly given to do that. Uh, Iraq was found in material breach of a variety of resolutions that had, uh, um, uh, that in the resolutions uh, had had consequences attached. You mentioned the, the sanctions, um, and it was clearly an understanding. Even if we're talking about the debate on resolution 1441, that this was a process. I mean. That, that's why there was such a controversy at the United Nations, because this was seen as part of a, a UN authorization for a war to remove Saddam from power. Now, when you and, and look, I, you know, the legal case is certainly secondary to the moral case. I mean, um, you know, I, again, I think a more fundamental point is uh, is a legal system, an international legal system, that would protect, uh, you know, tyrants like Saddam, um, you know, a legal system that uh, is functioning the way that we would like to see it. The problem that I see is that the legal case that was given it was 
there seemed to be a lot of flaws with it, uh, even with the evidence that was being f put forth was being discredited by Albaradai and Hans Blix. They weren't finding anything. And then, so when you look at, you know, the motivations, it puts into question the lack of transparency of the motivations. Who's motivated? I mean, like, the, I mean, look, the, the remarks by Albardi and, and Hans Blix, uh, and they have said subsequently that they they wanted to absent themselves as much from the decision not to be the occasion for a decision to go to war. Um, they did not view that as their, you know, quite rightly as, uh, you know, technocrats, if you were arms control experts, or allegedly so. They did not want to make what was essentially a political decision. They did not want to, uh, uh, you know, be seen to compel sovereign governments one way or the other, which I think is quite appropriate, you know, so because at the end of the day, uh, the decision to go to war resides uh, with the nation state. And, and these are matters of, uh, you know, to be decided by sovereign governments. And that is, I agree, but at the same time, if you look at the language of 1441, the language was saying that only IAEA and AMOVE could, to, could submit a report such that would... Uh, that did, first declare. of all, I mean, that, that would say that the, the only, that 1441 was going to be the only set of rules that was going to be applied to Iraq when it came to going to war or not. And I don't think anybody would accept that that was going to be the only part of the calculus or the only vehicle, that that would be um, the sort of yes or no triggering mechanism. Even those who wanted a second resolution uh, didn't see 1441 as dispositive as a matter of international law. So either way you argue the case, um, uh, you know, the governments separately reserved to themselves the right, the decision to go to war or not go to war. The question was whether it was going to be uh, uh, a matter of an explicit UN resolution or to be conducted on the basis of uh, uh, UN resolutions passed as interpreted by the sovereign governments. And I think when you look at a lot of, there seemed to be an early 2002 regime change being the primary motivation at least rhetorically, and then it switched to weapons of mass destruction, and then it switched to uh, humanitarian. There seemed to be a shifting over those different time periods, and that, that begs the question of, is there a shift of true motivations? Now, I would say that, th you know, we sort of were working our way through what regime change ac actually meant and why regime change, as opposed to containment, the, the previous policy. Uh, was to be preferred in these circumstances. And again, I think it was a cumulative effect of, of the three fundamental elements in, in the Bush argument, argument you know, components that received differing emphases at, at different times. So the case, broadly speaking, was always a case for regime change, and the, uh, the alternative to regime change was continued containment of the regime. And the, the fear of renewed and, and uh, current weapons of mass destruction was, was part of the argument for regime change. The broader uh, sort of security or geopolitical argument was a second element in that. And then uh, uh, the liberation argument, as I would call it, was the third and uh, certainly in my mind always the most compelling uh, of the three. And so but they're all kind of a subset of regime change. So, but why wasn't regime change ever brought up to the UN? Oh, I think it was. I mean, if you read the, uh, the September speech sorry, to the UN, the, the regime change was always a component, uh, in, in certainly in the president's presentations or the administration's presentations to the UN, and in particularly the uh, September 12th uh, address to the General Assembly. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, the UN is poorly structured to... Uh, uh, deal with cases that are directly argued on an American national security interest and uh, equally poorly structured to deal with the question of liberation, although, um, uh, or the illegitimacy of, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, failing governments, although Kofi Annan has tried in recent years and there was an effort uh, 
uh, in response to the crises in the 1990s in the Balkans and in Africa to to try to steer the UN in, in this direction. Uh, but certainly at this point, um, the one part of the case that the UN was sort of structurally prepared to deal with was the weapons of mass destruction argument. And so, as I said, by going to the UN, it sort of diverted uh, the attention uh, more heavily towards the w WMD argument and away from the other two elements. But in the President's uh, rhetoric and in his speeches, and particularly as part of the American domestic political debate, those three elements were present, I would say, throughout uh, throughout this entire period, and, and certainly very explicitly mentioned by the president in every one of his major speeches. Right, his speeches, but I think there's a distinction between the rhetoric of a speech versus the legal case, and the international lawyers that I've talked to say there's no what? international I, legal precedent for regime change, changing the sovereign government of a nation, you can't do that in international law. Well, I, 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 uh, that, uh, look, I am not an international lawyer, so, but even if that's true, I would say that underscores a shortcoming of international law. Um, Americans believe that legitimacy of a government flows from the c consent of the governed. And whatever you can say about uh, Saddam's government in Iraq, it hardly received, you know, uh, the legitimate consent of the governed being the Iraqi people. Um, so it is possible to have a regime that may have been legal by international standards, but at the same time morally and politically illegitimate. So. You know, this may underscore the need to reshape international law in ways that, uh, you know, reflect individual political rights above national sovereignty. So what I hear is that if a law doesn't suit our national interest, we can just selectively not follow it if there's no sovereign authority to enforce it? No, I don't think that's what I said at all. I said that there are shortcomings in international law, that there was a different legal basis for the Iraq War. Um, uh, and and that the Iraq War was uh, uh, conducted on a different legal basis or a legal basis that pre-existed Resolution 1441 and was buttressed by Resolution 1441, and that the purpose of international law is not merely to sustain itself. It cannot be immutable. Uh, there are things that are now outlawed according to uh, international standards that once were uh, quite accepted. So inter international law is not, you know, revealed faith. It's an attempt to structure and to enforce a just political order. And if we take a step back and we look at arms control agreements, like the nu Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, or other arms control agreements, what is your general viewpoint towards these agreements? Oh, uh, there's there. I'm sorry, so, that the arms control treaties and other international treaties are, I mean, if, if the question is, are these useful? Uh, sorry. Um, sorry. I'll go back again. Um, look, international treaties and arms control agreements, uh, if, if the question is, are they useful tools of American national security, the answer is clearly yes. Um, but uh, again, they're, they're tools, they're not the, the purpose of. American national security. Um, you know, the goal of American national security is to uh, make Americans safe and make make the world safe for uh, American principles. So they they can be useful tools under certain circumstances. There are inherent problems with arms control treaties. There are inherent problems with uh, all tools of of uh, national security. I mean, I'm neither in favor of nor ipso facto opposed to uh, arms control treaties or international agreements. So should we as a country, the United States, be striving to implement all the provisions of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty? Um, um, as, as long as we are, sorry, si look, as long as we are signatories to the treaty, we should try to fulfill our, our treaty obligations. Um, um, You'd have to say that, as a matter of reality, the United States is not the most dangerous proliferator in the world. And the problem is, uh, unfortunately, with those countries who either have withdrawn from the treaty or don't observe the treaty to which they're a signatory and have essentially announced their intentions to, to break out of the treaty. 
it may be at some point that the NPT is no longer a particularly effective tool and uh, you know there may be elements of it that we would want to modify or you know no arms control treaty is forever the question you know the primary test of the treaty is a utilitarian one is it serving the purpose for which it was written and more fundamentally is it a useful uh, making a useful contribution to American national security but why, I mean, it, we, it is true that we're not proliferating, but by, by not disarming our own nuclear weapons, it, it seems to set a tone for other people to not, to, you know, it was a carrot and stick type of, you know, the, the carrot was, you know. That's, I mean, those are quite separate issues. Proliferation and our own armaments are, you know, uh, uh, two sides uh, of two different coins, you might say. Um, again, the test of both, of our own defense program and our own and our uh, uh, and the treaties that we sign uh, do they seem to enhance uh, our security um, why would you extend that uh, simply to nuclear weapons and not to conventional weapons the mere fact that we possess any weapons at all you could say by that argument is uh, a justification uh, for others uh, arming themselves. Uh, look, I think that fundamentally confuses the purpose of the United States and the world. Uh, I'm comfortable with a well-armed and a nuclear-armed United States. The United States is working for very different purposes in the world than, say, North Korea or Iran. Right, but when, when you see the United States taking action under the, the, the name of nonproliferation to a country that we know does not have nuclear weapons, does that not encourage countries like North Korea or Iran who do have nuclear weapons to see that as a deterrent? For Iran and North Korea to see it as a deterrent of themselves? Deterrent of uh, preventing the United States from invading. One of the reasons why uh, North Korea or Iran could say, well, we're safe because we have nuclear weapons. Well, I think that's, it. yeah, but it's not, it's not our adherence or non-compliance with a treaty that uh, brings North Korea or Iran to make those decisions. North Korea and Iran fear the United States because uh, they understand that there's a fundamental, you know, uh, political argument there and that uh, the United States uh, possesses great military power. And, you know, there, there are enemies. And from their point of view, it seems rather logical that they would would fear the United States, and and they believe that by obtaining nuclear weapons, they will deter us. I guess what what do you see as the role for uh, the United States and our military to kind of uh, ensure security both within the United States and around the world? Well, I mean, and that's hard to boil down to anything less than another hour's worth of interview. But look, I mean, the most the United States military has a and the national security uh, institutions have a variety of uh, things that, that we're trying to achieve. Most immediately, our own physical security. Um, but also, we're trying to preserve, um, uh, mercifully, a, a relatively peaceful and increasingly liberal uh, world uh, order. Um, you know, Europe is generally at peace now, I would say in large measure because of American actions there uh, over the past century. Uh, the same is true of East Asia. We no longer fear the Japanese Empire, uh, for example. Um, so, you know, today's world is a remarkably uh, peaceful and, and free one, and we hope to maintain that, preserve it, and where possible, uh, expand it. There are still uh, uh, countries, elements, groups around the world who are dissatisfied uh, with the way the world is, who, who don't have the same political beliefs that we do and are willing to do violent things to try to uh, either attack the United States or prevent our uh, political, economic, cultural uh, influence from, uh, from expanding around the world. And if you would look at the threats facing the United States from both now and in the future, do you see 
terrorism as being the biggest threat, or do you see the rise of a totalitarian state who, uh, to be the next superpower, to be potentially even a bigger threat? Well, I, I, I think these things are interwoven. I'm sorry, what? The, the, I, I would say actually that there are three dangers uh, to, to uh, the generally benign and liberal order of the current moment. Uh, f first is very clearly terrorist groups. But it's impossible to separate out the phenomenon of terrorism from the general uh, political collapse in the Middle East. Uh, terrorism is a response to illegitimate governance uh, uh, throughout the region. Uh, and then we have to be concerned about uh, what direction China is going to take. China is becoming a much wealthier nation. They've expressed their own sort of dissatisfaction with certain elements of the world as they find it today. And the question is, um, I mean, also at the same time, the American-led global order, if I can just use that shorthand, has been the framework for China's modernization. So the question is how to integrate uh, China uh, in ways that protect our values and protect our interests, yet uh, 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 maintain the peace. Uh, so, uh, and, and keeping those three elements uh, in proper balance and also preventing, uh, uh, say, the attempt to um, liberalize and democratize the Middle East from becoming an occasion for a larger great power struggle uh, are, are certainly the things that I would be concerned about. And when you look at the current status of the United States as the largest military and economic superpower, can you speak to that and why is that important to preserve? Well, um, first of all, I mean, it is a fact. The, the fact of American superpower is sort of undeniable to friend and foe alike. And it is the framework uh, in which the current, again, sort of generally peaceful and liberal international order uh, has come into being. Uh, it wasn't the Europeans themselves who sat down around at a table and decided to stop going to war against one another. It was because Germany was defeated and uh, the Soviet Union collapsed at the close of the Cold War and it was not Imperial Japan that reconsidered its desire to create an East Asia uh, uh, prosperity sphere. Uh, it was American actions in the world that have proven themselves to be um, the most reliable agent for both human freedom and uh, uh, a more stable uh, world. So um, absent any other mechanism to, to preserve both peace and prosperity and to, to advance the cause of freedom, um, you know, for the time being, um, it's essentially up to the United States to provide the leadership to, to maintain that world. And can you speak kind of on a philosophical level the, the forward uh, strategy of our defense um, and how, as opposed to being centralized within the United States, mm -hmm. how a forward strategy can actually... Well, this is particularly true in the, in the case of terrorism, but is more generally true that it's much better to, to fight over there than it is to, to fight on our own streets. I mean, September 11th sh certainly should underscore that, that given the opportunity, um, there are people out there who will attack Americans in their homeland, in their cities, um, and, and certainly uh, even prior to September 11th, uh, there were a lot of people who were willing to attack and kill Americans uh, around the world. Um, just speaking personally, one of the most formative uh, experiences for me was to visit the Cobar Towers complex uh, after the bombing there. I was working in the Congress at the time, and and that was a pretty vivid testimony to what people were willing to do to uh, to Americans abroad. Um, uh, so, um, look, if if we intend, if we value the world we live in today, um, then it is essential for Americans to try to maintain the peace, to expand human freedom uh, and to preserve the gen again I'm repeating myself but the well, what I would regard as the uh, relatively stable uh, relatively peaceful and by historical standards remarkably free world that we live in
in, when you look at strategies to do that, um, you know, let's take uh, regime change as an example. Mm -hmm. uh, why wouldn't the United States take a tactic of indicting Saddam Hussein for war crimes and using the international legal structure to try to put str pressure on the regime uh, to put a taboo? Why didn't the United States try that? Well, look, I mean, trying people for war crimes tends to be something that happens after the war. Uh, and that was certainly true uh, after World War II. It was true uh, uh, after the Balkans Wars. We were only able to indict and to bring to justice, although the trial is still ongoing, uh, Slobodan Milosevic after he had been uh, actually voted out of office by uh, uh, the people of Serbia. Um, so indicting uh, sitting state leaders, A, is just practically difficult to do, probably impossible to do, you know, through the United Nations or to get a United Nations uh, uh, sanction to do that. Uh, so um, it, it is left to uh, uh, the world to come up with a, a practical, effective enforcement mechanism. It, you know, if, if the world intends to live by a decent set of legal or, or moral standards, it must also face up to the enforcement requirements uh, that that come with those principles. It is one thing to protest uh, injustice around the world; quite a different thing to bring the people who do injustice to to reckoning. But when you look at when it, I mean, it's a separate issue. But if you look at the international legal structure of the United Nations, it's not set up to have a sovereign enforcing authority, so it's up to the individual states to independently follow that. That, that is exactly my point. The United Nations and the, the, even the broader structure of international law, say the International uh, Criminal Court, um, is a legal system without an enforcement mechanism. To me, that's not simply amoral, but, but immoral. To desire the ends without willing the means uh, is the height of moral irresponsibility. If you're serious about your legal or moral principles, then there are obligations that you have in order to, uh, not simply to, to make a statement, but to do practical things in order to make the world a more just place. And when you, going back to uh, indicting for, for war crimes, if you look at Charles Taylor of Liberia, he was someone who was indicted. And, and you know, so why why not do it? It's it's there's a precedent. Well, look, I mean, he was on his way out of power anyway. He's he Charles Taylor hung on way too long, and his fate at this point, you'd have to say, is is up in the air. Um, again, to figure out that Charles Taylor's regime was an illegitimate and violent one was not something that necessarily required a legal procedure. Uh, to make happen, and uh, it wasn't really the legal procedure that forced him to give up power anyway. It was a, that was essentially a political process. Uh, luckily, it didn't involve a full-scale invasion, uh, but if it had come to that, uh, again, dictators tend not to step down so peacefully. Uh, if we look at the situation in Sudan, uh, today, for example, um, that's not a humanitarian crisis in the sense of being a hurricane or a natural disaster. That's a result of policies uh, enforced by Khartoum. And anybody who thinks that, that that genuine humanitarian crisis, that crisis of humanity, is going to be solved um, in some other way than by uh, bringing political pressure to bear on um, and the Sudanese regime, I, again, I think, is to divorce uh, ends from means in a way that's that's pernicious. But it, it, when you look at the mechanism for uh, exerting political pressure, that first step is usually putting a taboo of a war indictment. So why not even try? But we again, we can. Well, if you forecast any likely outcome, say in Sudan, that that's not no, going I'm, to happen. I'm talking about an, no, Iraq, but 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 but, but it's but it, Sudan is a good case because it's because it's speculative at this point and because the world faces choices about what might be done about this. No, you know, by all reckonings, uh, uh, the crisis in Darfur is the most immediate and pressing humanitarian crisis on the planet. It comes 
not even before uh, the peace treaty is signed uh, in the case of the civil war in, in southern Sudan. Um, now, what is the world going to do about that? To, to indict uh, the regime or the leaders of the regime uh, it, it can't be done through the United Nations. You can't even get a Security Council resolution through the United Nations because of Chinese and other objections to that because entirely for political reasons. So there is no international mechanism that's available to solve the problem. Does that mean the problem goes away or does the problem remain? If this problem is going to be addressed, it's going to be addressed by political action by sovereign governments who are willing to take the steps necessary to stop it. And such was the case in Iraq. Uh, there was no legal mechanism and certainly no obvious legal mechanism either through UN sanctions or any of the other tools available to the UN, which at this point, or at that point, was going to, which any credible person could think was going to remain effective. The talk at the time was all about smart sanctions, which meant lesser sanctions than what existed previously. Saddam had manipulated the sanctions regime to impoverish his own people, yet preserve himself in, in power. Th there was no chance that Saddam was going to be indicted by an international tribunal sanctioned by the United Nations because it would have been vetoed by probably a handful of members of the Security Council. So uh, uh, what were the practical alternatives? You either have to live in a world where regimes like this uh, survive and even thrive, or uh, the civilized nations of the world, if I can use that term without being, you know, thought a wacko, um, or, or people who do want to see justice done in the world are willing to take the steps necessary to enforce, you know, what seems to me to be a very clear case of justice done. And when you, um, you take a step back and look at what we now know about the infrastructure of the weapons of mass destruction seem to be mm. that the inspectors seem to do a pretty good job of dismantling it. And so when you look at why we went to war and you want to say, why did the United States go to war with Iraq, what would your response be? Well, again, I would say that the, the other two elements of the argument are the ones that have, uh, meaning the liberation argument and the, the broader national security argument are the ones that proved to have been, you know, uh, uh, more durable. But look, the, the, there's no question that Saddam had, had used weapons of mass destruction. The United Nations found after the first Gulf War that his nuclear program was farther advanced than we thought. But if you catch a murderer while he's reloading his gun or is out of ammunition, you're just lucky. Uh, and it's not a basis for justice or strategy uh, to turn your head while uh, a man with a previous track record of a guy like Saddam with a clear capacity to reacquire these programs uh, and, and the means to finance them, uh, you know, is ignored and, and allowed to, to reacquire uh, such weapons. We see in the case of Iran where the, the mere threat of uh, the acquisition of nuclear weapons, you know, entirely distorts uh, the way the rest of the world uh, deals with uh, a similarly repressive regime, likewise in, in North Korea. So again, if, if we got Saddam while well, he happened to be out of ammo and we didn't know it, that's just simply luck and a good thing. And when you, um, some people on, when they look at some of the uh, administration figures who are in policy positions, they see affiliations to the project to American uh, the project project for, for the New American, American Century. Century. Yeah. Uh, from your sense and being involved with this, do you, do you see that there was any influence in some of these planning papers? Uh, well, uh, look, as, as a former uh, deputy executive director of the project, uh, I would like to think that we were hugely uh, persuasive, uh, but it's not so. In, in my mind, this is a case of, it's, it's like the perfect storm for uh, uh, for somebody in the think tank world a in being sort of at the right place with the right ideas at the right time. Um, uh, so certainly if there was any influence it was entirely indirect and it was because uh, the project and like-minded institution uh, 
ad institutions advanced ideas that the American public uh, found persuasive. Uh, the Bush administration w couldn't have been regarded as um, uh, of like mind uh, to the project or other so-called neoconservative types prior to September 11th. But after September 11th, there was a, a willingness to uh, to view the world uh, differently. And again, just happened to be um, on hand with what proved to be a persuasive set of ideas at a time that you know the American political dialogue was looking for such things. But do you think that is? Do you see part of the um, project for New American Century's goals to kind of like remake the Middle East, and do you, and also do you see uh, this have to do with also protecting the, the uh, security of Israel? I, I would say it's only secondarily or tertiarily driven by any concerns over Israel. My own, I'll just speak for myself. My personal view is that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is of far lesser strategic importance than. Uh, than generally believed um, by many people in the United States, and if you know, if if I could fix one problem of the Middle East, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict wouldn't be that problem. Um, far more concerned about Saudi Arabia, about Egypt, uh, about Iran, uh, about Pakistan, um, uh, than I am about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, so I think. The Israeli connection is a, you know, pretty bogus one, uh, and and, you know, I, I I certainly look at this in terms of my interpretation of what American interests and principles are. Is it in the American interest to prevent uh, totalitarian states from acquiring the oil reserves in Iraq? Well, yeah, I would say so. Look, we okay. know we know. Look, we know there has been a totalitarian totalitarian government in Iraq that enriched itself uh, with the proceeds of its oil industry and it used those proceeds to build a big army and to invade its neighbors and to provide a big uh, threat to regional stability, to American interests, um, and on and on and on. Uh, the problem has been for too long, if I may quote the September 11th Commission, that too many of our relationships in the region have been solely about oil, and and we have learned much to our great sorrow what else has been going on in that region uh, for lo these many years. Uh, and at this point, um, we're trying to play catch up to to bring a better set of governments and a more liberal set of governments and one hopes a more democratic set of governments to a region that suffers from a lack of democracy, a democracy deficit. Okay, interesting. And uh, also, um, when you look at the, uh, the also the, uh, the, the bases, uh, military bases, do you see that as also part of the motivation to have military bases within Iraq? Well, look, even if we're totally successful in quelling the insurgency in Iraq, Iraq will continue to live in a dangerous neighborhood. It's a region where American military presence has been constantly on the rise since 1979. Um, it's an area of great strategic importance to the world, not only to the United States. Um, why would we want to withdraw uh, from a region uh, that we've invested a huge amount of treasure and now uh, an unfortunate amount of, uh, of blood in. We don't want to abandon an experiment in Iraqi or Arab uh, democracy to the tender mercies of the states that surround it and to the continuing uh, you know, insurgency at some level, the terrorism attacks that will continue whether we're there or not. Terrorists are now targeting uh, Iraqis primarily and, and contractors of other nationalities. So the terrorists, not simply do they have a beef with us, but they have a beef with the Iraqis and they have a beef with uh, the whole idea of a, a Shia dominated government and be a democratic government in Baghdad. So I am under no illusions that, that American uh, 
national interests, security interests, and certainly our political principles are pretty fully engaged in Iraq and will be for years and years to come. The whole purpose of the exercise is to make it safe for us and to make it safe for our principles. And I think the issue is the lack of transparency. Some people think that that was our primary motivation is to have that presence there. It would be nice to say that we had a plan before we got into this. I mean, I, th I really think that even now we're still kind of making it up as we go along. Um, uh, this happened because of the events of September 11th, which transformed the way people looked at things. Um, but again, it awoke us from a pleasant dream about what we thought the world would be like to face a world that was very different and very, very dangerous. So we haven't got anything but the most macro level strategy. The president has said, I want to transform the Middle East. I want to liberalize and democratize the Middle East. Translating that into a practical policy basis, a day by day um, uh, set of guidelines for, for any government uh, of any administration, setting priorities. What's important today doesn't seem to have the same importance as it did yesterday and things that were important before September 11th seem less important now. So we're still very much in the formative stage and you know thanks to our democratic process there is a fair amount of transparency about this. There's a huge amount of debate. Well I'm not sure if pacifist is quite right but certainly libertarian. Yeah. He he never <laughs> met you know. He didn't have a lot of sympathy for liberating Arabs or other folks. Well, do you want to do that again? Yeah. Let's just uh just sit there for like ten seconds or so and